honorary professor of techno-anthropology at Aalborg University in Denmark, chairperson of the UNESCO World Commission on the Ethics of Science and Technology, and member of the Domain Board, Sciences and Humanities of the Dutch Research C Council in WO. Today, Peter Paul will be talking about artificial intelligence and ethical disruption. But before handing over to Peter Paul, a few housekeeping notes that I should mention here. The first one is that if you, um, if you have any questions, uh, please, uh, during the talk, use the chat function to send a question. This is, uh, this is the only way for you to ask questions. I'll collect the questions and, and ask them at the end of the, the talk. The, the talk will last for about 45 minutes, followed by around 30 minutes of questions. Um, and then another note is that the video will be available online hopefully soon on Asser YouTube channel and um, and that's pretty much it from uh, uh, for now and I would like to hand the floor to Peter Paul and thank please you, go thank ahead. You. Thank okay. you, thank you. Let me first upload my slides. That always takes a little while but then I can use them as a background and that works quite nicely. Wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor actually uh, to speak also in the context of an MVI program, which it is partly. Socially Responsible Innovation is a, a program within uh, NWO. And I'm actually uh, quite active in that field, also a member of the program committee for that. So in that sense, it's also for me an honor to contribute to a program funded uh, from, from that. So now I hope that it all works and that I can also operate my slides and I can. That was what I wanted to find out. So um, thank you, uh, Satyat. Wonderful to be here. Yeah, what I would like to speak about is uh, about the ways in which AI disrupts ethics. And maybe that sounds quite negative and I don't want to be that negative, actually. Let's say disruption as a challenge. A challenge in terms of, um, well, AI seems to, to, to toy with the central notions that we use in ethics to do uh, ethics, notions of agency, accountability, responsibility. And what I would like to do in this talk is to explore how AI systems are doing that and how we could address that, what a good way could be to deal with that situation ethically. Maybe the key of the whole thing is that um, AI seems to be a cognitive kind of technology, a thinking technology, as it were, yeah, where the human thinker seems to make place for a technical thinker, as it were. AI uh, helps us to make sense of the world. AI is able to process large sets of data, and therefore it has this kind of hermeneutic function to use a very big philosophical word, an interpretive function. It also means that uh, AI is affecting the decisions that human beings make. And of course, in the military context in which we are speaking today uh, for the ASSA Institute, this is an extremely important discussion. And we've all seen the uh, big, uh, well, uh, um, well, um, I say things that people tried to put on the agenda regarding killer robots. Can we enter into a situation where we would delegate the responsibility to make decisions about life and death to uh, AI systems or not. Eh? So there's a campaign to stop killer robots, eh? just like uh, many people in chemistry have signed uh, a petition that they don't want to uh, be engaged in chemical weapons. Uh, should AI researchers also engage in a campaign against killer robots? So it's kind of a big discussion. And um, what I would like to do is to explore the basis below this discussion. Typically in that basis, it's always about human control. And uh, the way in which we want to deal with this is to develop forms of meaningful human control. And the standard lingo for this, which many of you will know, is whether the humans are in the loop, on the loop, or off the loop. And so if you're in the loop as a human, you still can exert some control. You operate the drone and the drone can act at a distance, but you can also operate the drone. Yeah, you're really uh, actually on the loop, yeah, so the system works automatically but asks some form of permission from the operator before firing, for instance, or humans are totally off the loop, then the system is totally autonomous, yeah, like a mind that goes off when you hit it. There's no human involvement anymore over there. This whole discussion about the humans and the loop, as it were, reflects a lot of discussion that we see also in other AI ethics subfields. 
which is always framed in terms of AI versus the human. Should AI be able to do things that in the past only humans could do? How far can we go there? And on the other hand, how could we actually design AI in such a way that humans stay in control? How can the algorithms be become explainable uh, so that we can actually be uh, still accountable for what we do? So what I would like to do here is to uh, well explore the situation a bit differently, not to frame AI as something opposed to the humans, but to frame AI as a mediator of human decisions. And for doing that, I actually want to dive a bit more deeply into the nature of human AI relations. How are AI systems connected to human beings? And therefore, how do AI systems help to shape decisions that human beings make? Like a connection to the idea of ethical yeah, like disruption, it's maybe also good to know that um, uh, there is actually quite a, a big uh, team of people working in the Netherlands at the moment on the ethics of socially disruptive technologies. Uh, with a 10-year gravitation project, we try to explore how new technologies urge us to rethink ethical categories. And one of the domains there is digital technologies. And one of the examples that we've always used uh, to explain what we wanted to do is actually the idea of a humanoid robot yeah, with the example that in Saudi Arabia, personhood was given to Sophia, a humanoid robot. And to show that this is ethically disruptive somehow, if we blur the boundaries between human agents and non-human agents, and you can just make a list of some ethical concepts that are challenged then and that are all interlinked somehow. And so if we make a robot a person or an AI system and give an AI system forms of responsibility that are normally only associated with human beings, then of course, a lot of things start to, to change. I mean, a persons act, but what does action mean for a robot or for an AI system? If action means indeed to have the freedom to do something you were not asked to do, then well, maybe indeed they can act somehow because the algorithms learn, they develop themselves in interaction with their environment and do things beyond what the designers put into them. But human agents are also responsible for their behavior. So what can responsibility then mean for an AI system? Does it mean that we have to uh, load them with ethics? But if so, what kind of ethics? Who can determine what should be the universal ethical standard when we have ethical diversity in the world? So can we also program ethical diversity in a robot? Uh, persons have human rights. Should we also have robot rights? And it sounds quite an absurd idea to many people, but as soon as you dive a bit more deeply into the discussion, it's maybe not as absurd as it might seem. In Japan, AI systems are being developed that learn uh, in their interaction with their environment, not through making some kind of a framework, a set of uh, well, basic kind of categories with which to understand the world, but they learn by sensations uh, of uh, pleasure and pain, whatever a sensation might mean for a robot. But still, robots are trained to learn from what hurts, as it were. And of course, as soon as you start to develop a robot that can feel pain, the first question that pops up is, okay, should we set limits to that? But of course, then the question is, what is that robotic pain? Can there be such a thing as robotic pain? Well, persons are part of a democracy. How much room should we give for AI systems in our democracy, etc.? And so if you change one concept, if we blur the boundaries between the human and the uh, artificial agent, then a lot of things happen in ethical theory. So that's what I would like to address. Maybe as an int introduction also, it's good to say that I think we should place AI in the realm of a whole set of new um, uh, technical developments, yeah, which people have often now come to call Industry 4.0. And where after the first industrial revolution of the mechanization and the water power, steam power that came into being, there was this second wave of mass production. Uh, the third wave then, a wave of automation. And now we are in the fourth wave of the cyber physical systems, basically meaning that the information technology becomes physical, becomes material. And the internet becomes an internet of things. AI is in a robot. Our whole everyday life world is, you could say, uh, well, mixed up, flooded with uh, digital technologies. And in Japan, people even now use the concept of society 5.0 to indicate the society emerging from the fourth industrial revolution with a slightly different organization of the history uh, of society in relation to technologies and a bit overly kind of deterministic, I must say. And I think there are more factors that drive history than innovations. But still, for the sake of the argument, here the picture is, uh, well, of course, at some point, society was a hunting society, hunter-gatherers, but then we managed to have a technology that enabled us to, to stay in one place, to re-fertilize the soil. The plow made it possible that we stayed in one place, that cities could come into being. 
helped us to move to an agrarian society, the steam engine to an industrial society, then the computer to the information society, and the fourth revolution now takes us into the digital society. And that's quite big changes. And of course, it goes faster and faster, but it means that actually a lot of the concepts with which we can understand our society also need to, to fine-tune, or to, to retune, redevelop. And that's the gist of the idea of ethical disruption. Not to say that everything goes, goes wrong, but more that we really need to find new ways of dealing with ethics and find, well, a recalibration or even maybe even a reinvention of ethical concepts. So I want to do this in three steps. First, I want to explore the nature of human AI relations. First, giving you a broad in, well, introduction into philosophical ideas about the interaction between humans and technologies, and then move that to AI. And then second, I will translate that to the idea of mediated intentionalities, mediated intentions of human beings, but also mediated ways of being intentionally so related to the world around us, perceiving the world, interpreting the world, making sense of the world. How do AI systems in many different ways uh, well, uh, trickle down <laughs> in our intentionalities and therefore also in the choices that we make? And then... Third, I will try to draw conclusions about the type of ethics that could help us to address the challenges that come with this. Guidance ethics, as I will call it, uh, as we have been uh, working on over the past years. So let's first go to the item number one, human technology relations. I think many people intuitively uh, make a, quite a sharp distinction between humans and technologies. Uh, there's of course uh, also a good reason for that. I mean, humans are subject with freedoms and intentions, they can be held accountable for what they do. Technologies are not, and that's the whole discussion about, whether the humans can still be in the loop. Technologies start to do things, the objects start to do things that were reserved once for the subjects. And I think this whole picture is an interesting picture. And of course, there is a difference between humans and technologies, but at the same time, it leads us astray if we really, uh, well, think that technologies are just out there in the world of objects while we are in the world of subjects. In fact, technologies are much more often this kind of mediator between humans and the world. If you operate a technology, if you work with your iPhone or your cell phone in general, I should say, uh, then of course uh, you have an interaction with the phone, but most importantly, the phone organizes the whole relation with your world. How attentive you are when you listen to a lecture, how you experience uh, a place where you are because you can make pictures uh, how you deal with your friends, how you find a good restaurant. Everything changes because this cell phone organizes in a new way the relations between humans in the world, which means that we actually should not locate uh, technologies in the world of objects, but somewhere between us and the world. When the iPhone 2017 model was introduced, Apple uh, showed this picture. Uh, of a, a hand axe and, uh, well, the then latest model iPhone. An interesting picture, I thought, because, um, well, in a sense, uh, there is a nice parallel between the two. Uh, if we look into the future, we are often very much afraid of how technologies could, well, destroy society, could take over things that only humans could do, etc. We've always had that fear. People destroyed the steam engine because they were afraid that it would take their jobs, etc. But if we look to the past, Interestingly enough, we dig up old technologies to tell us a bit about how people before us used to live their lives. And this is maybe the best way to understand that notion of mediation. Human existence rests on a technical infrastructure and the technologies that we have are not just neutral tools, but they make us human in specific ways. They help to shape how we live our lives, how we are human beings. So in that sense, AI is just yet another step in that, but a very specific step because AI is in the realm of our cognition, our, our thinking, our understanding of the world. But also here, there are historical examples of how that well happened before. Writing is a, a technology that, of course, has become totally common for us, but it was a contested technology in the time it was invented. Plato, Socrates, they were really worried that we would lose our memories if we would be able to write down everything. And of course, we have lost that type of memory, but we have a lot of memory back because we can read everything now in the text, in the books that we have been writing. The printing press is maybe yet another example of a technology that changed our minds, changed our thinking. The democratization of knowledge made possible by the printing press, which was suddenly not locked up anymore in monasteries, but knowledge could spread over the world. It was the foundation for the scientific revolution. Without the press, no scientific revolution. In that sense, AI is maybe yet another step in that material infrastructure for our thinking. Well, yet another step, uh, of course, an 
quite invasive step. And we need to understand the nature of that. If you go to that human world relation, the subject object relation, and the uh, well, human technology relation, then what this whole approach of mediation can bring is that technologies are not placed in the world of objects anymore, but in the relation between humans and the world. Technologies are part of the relation. They help to shape a relation. They help to shape how we act, how we behave, how we engage with the world, how we, how we do things. And so how we are in our world, but also how the world is there for us, how we perceive the world, how we interpret the world, how we make sense of the world in very many ways. So this is already quite a basic schedule to understand technology in general. This is actually a way of thinking that has been developed already in the 1980s by Don Eide, who even made a whole list of various types of human technology relations, several ways in which technologies can then be between humans and the world. And by embodying them, well, we form a unity with the technology and that unity is directed at the world, which the arrow signifies. You don't look at your glasses, but through your glasses to the world. Or you can read a thermometer, for, for instance, a thermometer gives you a representation of the world and you are directed at that representation. So that's why the arrow is here between human and the technology world uh, combination. Or there's an alterity relation, interaction with a technology, with an ATM, where the world is between brackets. It's about your interaction with the machine. Or technologies can even be uh, a context, be at the background of your experience, a fridge switching on and off automatically. So this is what Don ID uh, gave us, an interesting framework, I think, but the technology of the fourth revolution go much further than this. And that's what we should understand if we move into the realm of AI. This whole picture still bases itself on the idea that technologies are things that we use, like David Bowie is here using the first Apple Macintosh, hey, or like in the military, people are using military equipment as a tool, hey, where we set the goals and technologies are the means. And of course, the means have an influence maybe on how we behave, but use is still the main category of the technologies before uh, the fourth revolution. In the fourth revolution, this all starts to change. Technologies start to work on us in quite different way, to work on the human mind, the human body in new ways. Immersion, for instance, is one of the examples. Smart cities, smart homes, smart hospitals, where sensor networks are installed, that the Internet of Things enables our environment to see us, to perceive us, to, to work on us. A shopping window that puts a bit more light on an item that you look at a little bit longer to help you make the decision, as it were. And of course, in the military, the same is happening. The Internet of Things makes the world connected, not only the humans, but also the things, the weapons, but also the places where you can use those weapons, which also gives a totally new way of reading the world, making the world meaningful, and also therefore a new basis of making ethical choices about how to behave in that world. So technologies merge with our environment. They also merge with ourselves. <coughs> The brain stimulation, technologies in the brain or other parts of the body that help us to, well, to tweak how we function ourselves. And for the brain, this is super complicated because, of course, the brain is the organ that gives us freedom. And now we develop a technological way to develop a freedom towards that freedom. We can tweak how we are free, as it were. A dazzling consequence, which also, of course, has a lot of implications for how we can maybe even improve our function, if you can actually use that word at all. But the whole field of human enhancement uh, has often been uh, used in the context of the military. Can we actually well, improve parts of ourselves to be maybe more sensitive, more empathic, or to have more stamina, more energy, um, to feel happier, to, to, to be stronger somehow. Our cells, our own bodies become a design project in this way. Yet another way, augmentation. We add an extra layer of reality to our everyday experience. Eh? HoloLens, Google Glass, this extra layer, we look at the world through the device, but we also get information about the world which, of course, in the military sphere is quite, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, the case as well. And digital technologies that help soldiers to make sense of where they are in order to actually be able maybe to, to be much more accurate in what they, what they do. Or a totally different realm, the inter 
action, real interaction with technology as an author, as an author, as a quasi-human, hey, where a social robot actually shows forms of yeah, you could say emotions, whatever that may be for a robot. And we can actually show emotions to them and they can understand if we like it that they approach us or not, for instance. Which, of course, in the military also happens, where actually autonomous agents are being developed that can do things, that can fight, that also need to, to be able to interact with other people, to understand other people. And maybe, uh, uh, well, just two last examples to show you a bit about how the uh, scala of human technology relations has exploded, being present at the distance, eh? what we are all doing at this very moment, eh? which we have learned to do actually more than we wanted maybe over the past year, eh? which is in the military, of course, something that happens a lot. Drone pilots, not only perceiving at a distance, but also acting at a distance eh? with all the ethical questions that come with that. I will get to that later as well. And maybe the final example, um, cooperation eh, with AI systems. Cooperation meaning we uh, make choices on the basis of what AI systems tell us to do. Eh, a doctor sees a patient, the AI, the, well, the AI system looks at the patient record as well. Uh, and, and, but AI system also needs to understand how the doctor understands the patients. Eh? So it's kind of a triangular interaction between the AI system, the doctor, and the patient. And in the military, of course, the same thing happens. Cooperating with a robot, for instance, uh, to uh, go to, to mines or to, to go into an area where it's too dangerous for a human to come. Yeah, where we've even seen that people can get so attached to this kind of cooperative robots that they even mourn when they die, as it were. So um, this means that we have a whole new spectrum of human world relations, human technology world relations. And that's, of course, the basis for the second step of my talk, thinking about, uh, well, you could say, uh, the intentionalities that come with that. And so um, if a technology enters your uh, brain, of course, there is this fusion and human and technology become a physical unity directed at the world. Or if it merges with our environment and the internet of things, uh, then actually, it, well, there is a fusion between te technology and the world. And that's in, in, well, interacting or interacting with us as humans, also working on us. A drone pilot maybe is uh, yet another interesting example here where there is an interaction between the human and the control unit and between the drone and uh, the victim or the world out there, and also an interaction between the human plus the control unit on the one hand and the drone plus the world on the other hand. So it's three mediated relations, three ways where technologies play a crucial role in the decisions that soldiers make. And, well, we can go on like this forever. This is exactly what I wanted to do in uh, the rest of, of, of this talk, to explore further how we can deepen our understanding of those human technology world relations and the implications that they have for ethics, for our ethical relation with the world. For that, it's important to also make um, a step towards ethics first. It's important to be aware of the fact that this human technology world relation is a dynamic one. Olya Kudina, who used to work uh, in Twente and now works at TU Delft, made this very interesting model of uh, what she came to call the hermeneutic lemniscate, and where humans, technology, and world are uh, well linked together in a continuous flux of interpretation and reinterpretation. Uh, the easiest way for me to explain it is with the help of ultrasound. I did some research on ultrasound a long time ago uh, and about the impact ultrasound has on the ethical choices people make about an abortion. Not to say that I'm against abortion or in favor of it. Actually, I don't have any issue with it. It was more to understand the moral significance of technology. And we can say, okay, if you use ultrasound and first you start seeing it as a way to make a picture of the fetus, eh? typically ending up as the first picture in the baby album. So the fetus then suddenly it becomes visible before birth, which is quite new but it doesn't become just visible. It also becomes visible in medical terms. It becomes a potential patient because you can now see things uh, that can, can be an indication, for instance, of Down syndrome. And then suddenly actually getting a child with Down syndrome is not just fate anymore, but it becomes part of your responsibility. So technologies then suddenly became, well, devices that help you see that there is something wrong with your child, reconfiguring you <laughs> as people who might need to make a decision about the lives of their children, which makes ultrasound actually a technology that plays a role in abortion uh, at large, yeah, where now every pregnant woman gets a scan after 20 weeks to see if everything is okay. And so there's this continuous flux where we need to interpret the technology in order for the technology to help us interpret the world 
where the world becomes a new context for the technology, which changes us. So we are at stake as well. Of course, ultrasound is a mediator between a pregnant woman and the fetus. Uh, but actually, um, you should not see it as just a pre-given fetus, a pre-given woman, and then and the uh, scanner is just a filter between them. What a fetus is for us and what it means to expect a child have changed through ultrasound, even if we don't use it, eh? because we have now become responsible for getting a child with Down syndrome. Even if we don't want to have the scan, we could have done the scan. So that's how we could look at AI systems as well. They change how we understand the world, they change us, and that's a deeply ethical thing. And to come back to the, the uh, example mentioned before of drone pilots, of course, what happens here is a deep uh, in, intrusion, you could say, in the moral experience of a soldier. And maybe many of you have seen the documentaries made about this, which also show that it's very hard to treat soldiers who have been in this situation for their PTSS if they have it, because it's, it, it's a new form of disengagement that people feel. And well, on the one hand, they can look their victim straight into the eye, so they are closer than ever, or maybe as close as we were in the Middle Ages, as it were, to our victims, and you really kill them while you see that you kill them. And on the other hand, actually, you sit in your own place, and you can have a sip of Coke, and uh, you're invulnerable, as it were, nothing can happen to you. So the weird combination of Closeness uh, and distance is very hard to deal with. And the interesting thing is that this is an intrusion in a moral relation, eh? where, of course, people have to learn to work also with the system to give a place to the moral relation. Maybe one step further is also that technologies can also affect our moral frameworks. And there the idea of ethical disruption becomes even more interesting. Eh? With uh, uh, an example from a completely different field, eh? the medical world, We've seen uh, the phenomenon that has come to be called now value dynamics, value change, and where technologies affect the meaning of ethical values, sometimes even the values with which we evaluate these very new technologies. So that makes ethics super complicated. And so this example is about anesthesia. And so in the early days of anesthesia, it was a very contested thing to, to use. Uh, and I think it's not even so hard to understand that still, because the, the, the pain that you feel when you open the body was really seen as a clear signal, a signal of the integrity of the body, the sacredness, if you want, of the body. The body is not something that you just open. And somehow uh, cancelling out that signal, making people even sleep while you open their bodies, was therefore seen as the most disrespectful thing you could do. And you just don't do that to people. Whereas by now, of course, the opposite has well come true. It would be totally uh, uh, crazy if a doctor would operate on us without anesthesia. We would feel that that would be the most disrespectful thing that she or he could do. So values change in interaction with technologies. And that's an important thing to conclude. Um, okay, now let's go to an analysis of the intentionalities. How do AI systems mediate our intentional relations with the world? I think the most important thing is then to move beyond the idea that AI is an other, and that indeed we should be afraid that we have killer robots that do the killing totally autonomously. Of course, we can be afraid of that, and there is a point in being afraid of that. But I think even in that situation, it would lead us astray if we really think that we would then see the AI system as an other. It's still us making the decisions to do that, making the choices to use a robot for that, and letting robots also, uh, well, help us to interpret the world through their lines. And so many um, uh, foci, uh, focus points of AI ethicists, a robot ethicist, is on AI robotic systems as an other. But I think what we should do is try to, to expand that. Uh, we can indeed encounter AI systems and they feel like an artificial agent. They are not an artificial agent, but when we deal with them, they often typically also act like a mediator. They help to shape how we behave, how we understand the world, how we interpret the world, how we make choices. And that's where the ethics is. The ethics is not only about the question, should we allow a robot to do things that only humans could do? The real question is, how do AI systems change the way in which we make choices? And how can we find a responsible way of dealing with that very situation? So let me make a distinction between three types of uh, interaction or dealing with AI systems connected loosely to the idea of off the loop, on the loop, and uh, uh, in the loop, um, because they fit somehow in that world. Um, 
And what I would like to do is to explore what that means for human intentions. How can humans still be intentional beings in this situation where they work with artificial agents? So interaction is maybe the first example. Hey, with, uh, I think for many people, uh, the, the, the example of a social robot would now be this social robot of beautiful documentary movie made about it, Alice. Uh, uh, where elderly people really get attached to the robot and where actually the question pops up, indeed, uh, well, how should we see this? How should we design these things in a responsible way? And can we actually just take them still away from elderly people when they almost feel it as a quasi-human presence? I think it's worth to explore more deeply how the nature of the interaction with an artificial agent can be understood, especially if we also make the connection to the military field, where there are also a lot of artificial agents who, of course, do quite different things than taking care of elderly people. So I think here uh, the configuration is not alterity, uh, the human versus the robot, but a form of yeah, you could say reciprocity. Uh, they, they work on each other. They have to understand each other. So the human is intentionally directed at the artificial agent and the other way around as well. They have an intentional focus on each other. But of course, that raises the question, what kind of reciprocity is this? Can AI systems indeed have intentionality? What kind of intentionality is it? This is not a human intentionality. So it can be helpful here then to go back to older philosophical theories. <laughs> so sorry to make it a bit philosophical. Merleau-Ponty, the French phenomenologist, has this very nice uh, analysis of the chiasm as uh, the basis for any type of perception that humans can have. And the basis is actually quite simple. What we perceive, uh, especially in interpersonal relations, of course, we are always perceiving and also being perceived. We are a perceiver and a perceived. We are a subject and object at the same time. And what you can also feel for yourself is if you touch your own hand, you touch yourself as a subject and your other hand is suddenly an object. And what happens in a um, uh, well human AI relation where there is an interaction is that, of course, there's also a perceiving and a being perceived, but it's conditioned through a different materiality. Melopathy says for humans, it's, well, the, 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 the basis of it all is the flesh, as he calls it. We are made out of the same stuff that the other person is made of, and therefore we know what it means to be perceived, and that enables us to perceive the other. So this shows that human AI interaction is not just a line, but a cross. AI sees us and we see the AI system. And it also means that touching, uh, well, uh, physical interaction, but also understanding each other is something, yeah, you can say reciprocal. It, it, it also changes us to, uh, to interact with that being because the, the flesh changed. It becomes technological flesh, as it were. And the real question then is also, for me, not can there be such a thing, a thing as AI intentionality, it's more what kind of intention, what kind of intentionality can there be in a technology? I will not go into all the details of the slide here for the sake of, uh, of time, but the core idea for me would be, of course, AI systems have a form of intentionality. They are directed at the world as Don Heidi also explained so nicely. But then the, the ultimate question is not, can they have intention and should they or should they not have? It's more, what does that do to our intentionality? How do we get intentionally related, for instance, to people in a fighting situation, if there is this robotic animal there as well, that helps us also to reinterpret our intentionality regarding the other person. Dealing with this third element can still be an element of a relation. And so that also means that our interpretive frameworks change, that we start to perceive the other person also as a person that could be attacked by the robotic animal where, as it were, the flesh of the person also changes. And because the flesh of the robot is a different type of flesh than of the human, which also could do something to our moral engagement, our moral understanding of the vulnerability of other people, the kind of choices that we would need to make, the accountability that holds for, for us. And so the reciprocity between a human agent and an artificial agent has also a mediating impact on how we can be in, intentionally related to other humans. A complicated tour, maybe, but I hope I could make it clear. And maybe the second one is uh, about uh, AI systems being on the loop, and where there is a cooperation between humans and AI systems, and where actually <clears throat> humans are on the loop in the sense that they are, well, closely involved in making a decision. Maybe uh, 
a classical example <coughs> of this for me eh, of cooperating with a robot would be Paro. And maybe some of you know Paro. This is again an example from the field of healthcare. <coughs> Paro is a, a robotic seal that works uh, quite well for uh, elderly people with Alzheimer's disease, with whom it's hard sometimes to communicate on a cognitive basis, but uh, who can really benefit a lot from an effective relation with an animal like this. And many people, when they see it for the first time, they, they say, oh, this is not what we should do, right? We should do this ourselves. Why should we delegate the care to a robot? Why don't we care for these elderly people ourselves? But if you dive more deeply into the situation, actually, this seal is full of sensors and actually can also quite well detect how the elderly people are doing. Uh, they can detect differences in their way of dealing with it, but also maybe in their uh, type of gestures, uh, their temperature, their heartbeat, whatever. <clears throat> And as such, actually, the robot is an assistant in a sense, yeah? just like uh, in the military, a robot can assist the soldiers. Where there is not an alterity, yeah? the human versus the AI system, it's kind of a commonality. And yeah? so they have the same world. They are in a triangle connected to that world. The human is directed at the world. The AI system is directed at the world. And there also needs to be a connection between the human and the, and the AI system. The AI system needs to understand how the human can understand the world and the human, how the AI system makes sense of the world. Three intentional relations where three bases of responsibility are at stake. How should we design this AI relation to the world in a careful way? What does that mean for our understanding of the world? And also how should we organize the interaction between human and the AI system in a good and in a responsible way? So here, the hermeneutics, the interpretation has the form of some kind of triangle. And with the interpretation of the human are doubly effective, one, in interacting with the world, and two, in interacting with the AI system itself, which also means that our taking responsibility becomes a form of triangulation, if you want, just like medical doctors do that. So learning to read the intentionality of the AI systems, but also learning to read the hermeneutic mediations, how these AI systems actually make sense of the world and how they help us to understand the world. So also in the cooperation, there is this impact on interpretations and that's where human responsibility needs to take shape. And the final example, the re-embodiment, the human being being in the loop, yeah, where uh, of course the example then is a drone, uh, being present at a distance or in the field of healthcare, of course, you have a telepresence robot as well, hey, where the configuration <coughs> is actually, as I already explained, that the human being interacts with the controller, the robot with the world, and also the interaction between the human plus controller and the robot plus the world needs to be designed somehow. So here, the, this is mediated in, in, in intentionality <coughs> within three steps. And there's three arrow fields, as it were, where technologies play out how ultimately humans take responsibility for the quite intrusive decisions that they make about the world. And of course, here, the whole issue of the flesh recurs and the flesh as the basis for our perception. It's, uh, there's an interpersonal relation, but there is a robot in between. And the robot, in a sense, helps to shape uh, how we perceive the other person and how the other person perceives us. And so, uh, as I already explained, there is this, uh, also in this case, there is some kind of reciprocity of perceiving being perceived between the soldier and the victim, but the victim actually perceives a robot. And uh, the soldier perceives the victim through the eyes of the robot. And so if it's in the field of healthcare or a robot that enables you to look at a different place or something, of course, uh, there is uh, hands that you can raise, there's movements, gestures, and you, you can see other people, but they cannot see you as well. In the case of drones, maybe the problem is that you do have hands, you do have eyes, you do have ears, as it were. You, you do have this second robotic body that is also you, but on a different place. Where there's this technological flash, the technological material basis mediating the moral engagement that you feel with the other person. And you don't see that other person. So you, you, you don't, of course, you see the other person and you, you can look them into the face and that makes that you can feel their vulnerability, but they don't see you. They see a drone flying towards them. So there is a fundamental reciprocity missing here because of this new type of flesh, this kind of robotic flesh that does something in the basis for our interaction with other people. Okay, so that means that there is, again, three elements of mediation between the user of the controller, the controller and the robot, and the robot in the world. 
and that our interpretations, our sense making of the world, including our moral interpretations, are deeply affected by this also, especially that the distance and nearness theme that is so fundamental for making a sound ethical decision. Okay, so the last minutes of my talk. Um, how to make sense of this ethically? So of course, there is a lot of AI ethics and I don't wanna repeat that all. Uh, I've been engaged in it myself also, especially through UNESCO, where we try to come at some kind of a uh, framework for the whole world, also taking intercultural ethics into account, not only basing it on Western values, but that's not what I wanna do here because I think there's one uh, thing uh, that we could do that's in, indeed uh, formulating ethical values, uh, foundational texts, principles, uh, explainability, accountability, all, all those things, super important. But the most important thing maybe to make it come true is to, to, to see what they mean in practice. And for that reason, we have developed an approach which we have come to call guidance ethics over the past years. And that approach is actually to be seen as a bottom-up form of doing ethics. And ethics not just as saying, uh, well, we should stop the killer robots and we should say yes or no to a technology. The question is more, how can we responsibly deal with these new technology? Also doing justice to what we just heard, because the moral impact of technology is much richer than just having an impact on society, which we like or not. That's maybe that's the first step here. It's ethics as we've always known it. So technologies have an impact and then we can say, yeah, with good arguments, we can like or dislike or find a good or bad impact. But secondly, as the uh, ultrasound example showed, technologies can be part of our moral agency, how we make moral decisions, how we make sense of the world, or even uh, have an impact on our moral frameworks, on the meaning of values, like uh, the anesthesia example showed. <clears throat> so taking that into account results in the need for a ethics that well starts from practices. And that's what the guidance ethics approach is doing. You always start from a concrete technology, a concrete application of a technology in the context in which it should function. It's basically a very basic tool. Uh, it's, so this is, this is not rocket science. It's not gonna be a Nobel Prize winner ethical theory, not at all. It's just uh, something that you can use in practice to make sense of everything that I just tried to say more philosophically. And so first, you try to understand the technology in the context. Who is involved? What might it do? And just to, to, to have a closer understanding and phenomenological understanding, if you want, of the technology. Now, the second step is basically trying to identify the actors involved in the functioning of the technology, who is experiencing the impacts, and then the effects that the technologies can have. So what could the technology do unexpectedly? So how can ultrasound suddenly make us responsible for getting a child with Down syndrome, etc.? And then, most importantly, identifying the values that are at stake as soon as we see those effects. And then having a list of the values is not the basis to say, okay, we do or we do not want the technology. There is a basis for concrete actions. And so for instance, for a redesign of the technology, can we redesign the technology from the perspective of these values? How, how could that happen? Or can we adapt the environment? So with uh, rules, laws, uh, forms of regulation or other technologies to support the functioning of the technology that we are discussing? Or how can we work on the user, uh, empower the user, equip the user with forms of critical thinking, education, communication, etc. So this framework is actually an ethics from inside, not from outside. It's not uh, using a textbook saying hey, you are allowed to do that and you're not allowed to do that. It's more a form of accompanying technology from within. It's also positive ethics, you could say, not negative, which doesn't mean that it's always positive about any type of new technology, not at all. It's intended to be a basis also for being somewhat critical, but it's positive in the sense that it doesn't only want to focus on uh, understanding what we do not want and eh, to set the boundaries, but we want to understand what we do want and set the conditions for making true what we do want, positive ethics. It's focusing on values. <clears throat> And then third, maybe it's also important to say that this is, this is bottom-up ethics. It doesn't start from the ethical experts explaining what the guiding uh, theory should be or something, but it starts from the practice where people experience the impact of technology. So the professionals working with it, citizens experiencing the impact. So and just like you have citizen science, I think citizen ethics could be a very good word to explain what we are doing here. Well, by taking this whole tour through human AI relations, how they reconfigure us as moral beings, how they reconfigure our intentional relation with the world, the basis for our decision-making, using the metaphor of being in, on and off the loop, 
I hope to uh, have at least uh, paved the way for a, a deeper discussion on where the real ethical questions are uh, regarding AI in the military. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Peter Paul. Uh, fantastic presentation. Um, just to remind the audience um, that you could send your questions through the chat function and then I collect those and I ask Peter Paul uh, as they come through. But I can start by a question uh, which I personally have until um, and I wait for others to compose theirs. Um, one issue um, that came to my mind that made me thinking is that mediation theory, I believe, and, and, I, and I think it's, it is even known to be descriptively powerful um, to help us to see how our actions in the world are mediated by technologies, how our interpretation of the world is mediated by technology. And even you go on further and talk about how technology even affecting our perception of moral values and new responsibilities, moral um, responsibilities arise because now a condition is provided by technology and so on. For example, the case of ultrasound that you made. Um, but but um, you, you also emphasize that it's not all, all about yes and no, whether we want or don't want, but it's a lot about how we live with technology and you, you even say the same thing about AI, that we shouldn't look at AI as the other, but how it mediates the moral reasoning. You touched on this uh, briefly towards the end of your topic, but I'm wondering if there is ever a case that you would say, we would say no to a technology. Do you think, and do you think even if that's a question which should be asked, which should be answered by mediation theory, or you think there's other ethics that we have that could deal with that? What's your position on that? Do you, do you see yourself as someone who is illuminating some ethical sphere or someone who sometimes also makes some judgments Yes and no judgments every now and then. Yeah, very good question. Uh, indeed, well, I would say, um, yes, there is a possibility to say no to a technology, also with mediation theory in your hand, as it were. Yeah, so if I try to say that the question is not yes or no, but how, no, of course, but, I mean, the, the ultimate question to, uh, the, the ultimate answer to the question, how could still be not, right? But I don't think mediation theory is itself a normative theory. It is not. It is an analysis of how technologies organize our uh, well interaction with the world, our relation with the world, our understanding of the world. So as such, it is indeed maybe foundational, uh, but it, it helps us to get a richer picture of technology than we often use if the initial reaction is always, uh, we should do it or we should not do it. Um, so in that sense, I really see it as, a, um, as, well, as an extra basis for making ethical choices, but it needs a normative theory to, uh, uh, well, to be added to it to make that decision. Um, I could also say maybe another thing is that, um, of course, um, um, ethical frameworks uh, differ all over the world, etc. but there are also some ethical values that I find hard to give up. Uh, for instance, in, in, in the context of UNESCO, the uh, Human Rights Declaration functions as such, and such. Of course, there is a lot of discussion still about it, but you could see that this is a widely shared normative framework that we could use as a basis. And from that basis, indeed, delegating the full responsibility to a robotic system to do killing uh, might not be uh, the best idea. But then if you think more deeply, we have always delegated this type of responsibility to weapons already. And I think the real question then is not just to easily say, oh, we are against it. And then let technology be further developed and actually not be engaged anymore at all because you've just said that you're against it. <laughs> but try to understand more deeply how this has gone in, in the past and how it might ultimately change things. So that we can also, now that the, the technology is there, take the responsibility that it gives if you understand what they do, how they might uh, work on value change, how we might start to find things normal that we do not find normal now and that we might not want those things to become normal, etc. So there's a lot of questions also to think about when you speak about killer robots, which I'm against, 
but still to take them seriously because they could actually do much more than killing people. They could change our ethics, our ethical frameworks, and we want to understand and discuss that as well. Yeah, perhaps um, a follow-up question um, would be that you, you also looked at history and how historically new technologies made us more uh, capable of doing different things and being better or more capable humans in terms of, again, uh, interaction or interpretation of the world. And it seems, it seems that um, it seems that the mediation theory that, that you apply to an extent allows and, and in some ways embraces the, the technology making us better humans or new forms of humans. Do you think if there is anything human, purely human, so to speak, which can never be extended to technologies or replaced by technologies? Or do you think this is just something, an illusion, a historical thing, illusion that we have always had some sort of fear, but the new technologies every now and then they just come and tell us that, no, this is, this is not the case. We could also do this and you yeah. just have to live with us. Yeah, beautiful question again. Um, so I think the opposition is not uh, right <laughs> between humans and technologies. I think uh, there is no way to understand us without taking technology into account as a part of what it means to be human. It doesn't mean that I like any kind of technology, but I see it more as our fate. I think, uh, and uh, that also actually does, does not mean that I think that we become better humans through technology. Actually, technologies, I think, help us more to deal with our imperfection or at least with our lack of capabilities to survive in specific environments. And so if you look at the history of philosophical anthropology, people typically uh, see technology as an element of what it means to be human, uh, an intrinsic element, because this is our uh, trick in evolution, you could say. Yeah, so we don't have a very thick fur, so we need to make fire to keep us warm. We don't have very strong claws, so we need yeah, so, uh, well, tools to, to do hunting and to, to eat, etc. Yeah, so technologies have even become interwoven with our biological development. That's what those theories say. And I think there is an element of truth in that. And that means that we uh, can be authentic humans with technology as long as we stay somehow critical. So it doesn't mean that any technology is just good and the more technology, the better. It, it's not about technology per se, but of course we have the ability to reflect on what these technologies are doing to us and to make uh, ourselves better humans and uh, to reinvent ourselves hand in hand with the inventions that we have done. I think that is what ethics is all about. And that's basically also what I tried to convey in this lecture. New technologies bring new intentionalities, new ethical responsibilities. And it's up to us if we manage to understand that we are at stake here as moral beings and that we also need to take responsibility for that. Not because I like it, but because there's no other way. It's our fate. Yeah, thank you. So one question is about the values that uh, you refer to, and I assume this is also linked to the work that um, that uh, that you said you were doing in relation to also the human rights. Uh, are they are those values based on international human rights uh, and and the convention, or do you consider other values as well? And yeah, so, maybe you can even talk about the practicality of, of, of your work as well here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe I should make a distinction between two uh, types of involvement that I had with AI ethics through UNESCO. So one is as chair of the UNESCO World Commission for the Ethics of Science and Technology, COMEST. And there we wrote a preliminary study on AI ethics uh, from the perspective of UNESCO. Uh, and the second thing is that I was a member, the vice chair of the ad hoc expert group working on a recommendation, so a normative framework for UNESCO. And I think in the first role, we have tried to make a study on AI showing how AI works on, on the mind. At UNESCO, it's all about the mind, education, science, culture, uh, human communication, it's all the mind. And AI is working exactly there. So we try to address how is AI challenging education, culture, cultural diversity, scientific practice, integrity, etc. Then with the ad hoc expert group, we made a framework uh, with a, a team from people from all over the globe. That's uh, everything within UNESCO works like that. So the, the world is divided into six regions. Every region had four experts. 
So you can see this as an intercultural normative framework. Um, of course, it builds a lot on work that has been done already. Yeah? So all the standard things, as it were, uh, about uh, uh, well, avoiding bias and, uh, and uh, enhancing accountability through transparency and uh, well, making sure there isn't a diversity, inclusion, et that, that, that's all there. But we really focused on two points uh, that are maybe uh, specific for the UNESCO context. And one is uh, gender or maybe take a broader inclusion. Uh, so be very careful for the biases in the systems. Many people say that in the international context, the gender bias is maybe even more urgent than only in the context of some of the, of the European, for well, at least, I don't know, actually, maybe that, that's not even true, but it takes a different color in every context in which you discuss the gender bias. The second thing is sustainability. Uh, and I think that's a very important line of research that is getting, in, well, ever more intention. It's super important. It's, of course, not only the environmental impact of all the data centers needed for AI, but also the way in which AI could help us deal with environmental issues, the climate models, uh, but also uh, the way in which AI can work in the energy transition, uh, can uh, enable us to deal more responsibly with energy consuming equipment, etc. So in many places, AI can be uh, connected there. And then maybe if I can add a third layer. <laughs> so my current research interest is really moving towards intercultural ethics. And I think we might not even have done that enough in that ad hoc expert group. Of course, we wanted an advice that can be adopted by all the member states. So then you uh, end up into a framework that is acceptable to all. But I also think it's important that we have room for diversity, for cultural diversity, also ethical diversity. Ethical frameworks differ all over the world. And the interesting thing for me of working in the UNESCO context is that you have this uh, well, place where the whole world can meet to discuss these things. And where also typically the more, uh, well, the, the, the focus on the individual of Western ethics is counterbalanced by basically a five sixths of the world uh, where actually the individual is not as important as society or as a collective. And that interaction and the ways in which you, you deal with that, but also the way in which you, from an African point of view, can actually pay much more attention to, uh, um, uh, to time. And to the ancestors, to the future generations. And the whole idea of Ubuntu ethics is all about that. Or indigenous ethics, which is more about place, the, the meaning of place, the ethical, well, the, the, the ethical role of the land, as it were. That can all enrich our discussions a lot. And I think we need to do that much more in AI ethics, especially because it works on our mind, on our moral interpretation of the world. It's interesting because when you mentioned um, all the cultural diversities and the fact that UNESCO, you have people, representations from all across the world. One thing, one, I think, issue maybe perhaps is that a lot of population in the world, maybe close to maybe 50%, I don't know the exact percentage, they may not even have any internet access. So this whole AI thing, how global is it if a lot of people have don't even have very, very basic yep. um capabilities which are required normally for any sophisticated AI yeah. and, and is there any are there any negotiations in that and how do you include yeah. that yeah. or is it still true. ongoing no I mean all this is also in, in our recommendation and always I mean this is good to to be aware of I mean we can think very sophisticated about uh, bias and algorithms but uh, if you don't even have internet access uh, there's not not even uh, the condition for an algorithm to have an impact on you at all yeah, so, of course, that's not always satisfactory yeah, to write these things in a report on AI ethics, yeah? but it's super important to be aware of that. So, indeed, um, I mean, we have a long way to go as a planet, but especially in that context, I think it would be sad if we would make this one unified ethical framework. And that's, of course, the struggle that you're always in within the UN context. You want something for the whole world, but you also, in, in doing that, you want to make room for diversity. And ethically, I think that's... Uh, a challenge, but this is really uh, well. The coming years that I still have within Comest, I hope to uh, make uh, more. Uh, yeah, I some progress in that. We, we actually have we working on a conference on intercultural ethics uh, in November, a digital conference. I mean, that, that's one other experience that I had in this time of the virus that actually the conferences become much more inclusive when they're digital. People don't have to travel. They can afford to take part in the conference now suddenly. And we've organized a big conference in November and we had so many participants 
from uh, lower income countries, middle income countries who could simply not have come physically. And I thought, okay, this is going to be at least a good basis to do intercultural ethics. We should do digital and make sure that people can participate digitally. Yeah, thanks, Peter Paul. Uh, so I've got more questions coming from the audience. Um, you mentioned that the question we should be asking is what kinds of intentionality AI can have and how this impacts human beings on intentionality. If AI shapes human decision making, notably in ways that human users cannot comprehend and therefore cannot explain and justify their own actions that are impacted by reliance on these technologies, is this a fundamental challenge to humans on, uh, to humans' own intentionality uh, with respect to pursuing just warfare, considering that just warfare part of it also yeah, yeah. relies on human technology. Yeah, this is a real challenge. But I always try to, to make stupid comparisons. I, I think most people don't understand how their computers work and they can still deal responsibly with, with what the computers can do to them. And not always, and we discover ever new things. And it's, I mean, the social media are uh, affecting the elections. And uh, so, I mean, many things that the computers can do that we need to learn to live with. But yeah, there, there is no other way than to try to find that out. So I think at a meta level, we have to build the infrastructure to do that. And of course, understanding AI intentionality comes partly down to indeed uh, making sure that the algorithms are explainable uh, and that uh, the data sets are actually also uh, uh, diverse and that we can actually also check them uh, so that there is a form of transparency about the data sets, et cetera. So that's all part of understanding how AI systems understand the world. But I think on top of that, we should also develop an understanding of our interaction with them. So how are they affecting our choices? And so we need spaces for reflection and for learning how we are implicitly changed by that. And so to, to navigate in a lambda skate where the AI system understands the world, but also changes how we have a relation with the world, how we are at stake. I think that's all missing in the framework that only focus on uh, uh, um, explainability and transparency, et cetera. And that, but what we can add if we connect the human technology relation to this whole discussion. I wonder if you, uh, because I recently joined uh, the Osser Institute and have been working with the Dilemma team uh, since November, and it's the first time I'm working with lawyers. And one of the interesting thing is their, their views on, on human control and human agency may be slightly different from even philosophical views, and, and you would think philosophy and law are not really poles apart. You would think we, we have more in common than, say, with engineers. Uh, have you had the con um, interactions with them, and, and how do you see, and if you did, how do you see th these impacts, or what are the ramifications that, that the mediation theory has especially on international law yes, and yes. of course especially if it's on ethics of yeah i i do i mean uh, on a maybe on quite a uh small scale in a sense but uh, here in Twente we also did an MVI project <laughs> on drones not military drones though uh, and uh, there was a close uh, uh, interaction with uh, uh, the law department uh, at our university Michiel Heldeweg a very interesting law scholar who um, yeah I mean we really found the points of intersection between um, his uh, approach and mine so he's really working on experimental law and so much in line also with what I just said about or organizing a learning process. So what he uh, thinks that we need to do is to make space to um, to learn which law would fit the technology that we are designing, because basically the situation has always been that there's an innovation, it doesn't fit the existing legislation, so there is not enough clarity. It also uh, is, is, is an obstacle for innovation because uh, the developers are afraid that they might be sued, so they don't dare to continue. Uh, so what we need is a place to, to, to learn how to regulate technologies, and for that you need experiments uh, on a small scale with uh, rule low <laughs> zones, <laughs> law low zones, <laughs> how do you call that? Uh, so but you can do the, the experiment, and the experiment can be uh, inspired by ideas of mediation, uh, so, uh, or any other word that might do to understand the impact of technology on society and on individual human beings. Technologies affect how we behave, how we do things, and uh, so 
drones is of, of course it's about nuisance privacy uh, but also about uh, our democracy yeah? and if there is a drone doing forms of crowd control when there is a political demonstration how well how free do people still feel to engage in the demonstration to, to understand how these technologies are affecting uh, all these social practices is then a basis for uh, well making uh, laws that fit this and that can also connect the laws to the constitution and to things that are uh, found important in in our society so lawmaking as a design process basically a learning process in a place where there is fewer rules and where you can use mediation to understand what kind of rules we would need is that some sort of simulating simulating regulation the the works of uh, experimental law that you mentioned well that's also what you could do by simulating it i mean you can also do it in real life <laughs> I, I think with drones it's also really interesting because the current law is not very adequate i mean the 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 lower layer of the air as they call it is part of the legislation of the of, of the municipalities so if you fly to a different city there can be different laws so it's it's, it's, it's not doable right <laughs> so you have to well understand that and to discover that while you're doing it and that's uh, the idea of experimental law that we need to 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 make learning spaces and you could do that virtually but you can also do it for real and i think it also is super interesting if you take the idea of value dynamics into account if the values change if technologies also affect how we want to deal with privacy for instance then of course this can also help us to anticipate a, a future normative discussion uh, that we might have already now yeah, thanks, Peter Paul. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, and I wait for 30 seconds. If you want to have a sip of water, Peter Paul, I think it's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, and perhaps, um, yeah, I think I, I don't see any question coming. So I would like to really thank you, Peter Paul, for coming and accepting to give us a guest lecture and um, it was a great pleasure also for me uh, I didn't say it at the beginning but some of the people may not know that I, I was your student that's definitely you were one of the best yeah <laughs> yeah I did my master's degree with you uh, and anyways um, thanks again and I just want to also remind um, everyone that it's um, our next lecture is likely to be in June but the details will be um, will be on our website later on when when everything is settled and yeah thanks again and i wish everyone a great day or evening depending on the time zone that they're in and uh, farewell for now super thank you Sajad. bye bye